two things that make me happiest if I can achieve them in a story is to make somebody laugh or to make them feel kind of a sense of eeriness or, or maybe a chill. And in some ways, I think the, the, the two sensations, they run parallel with each other. In fact, sometimes I think they're more or less the, the same thing. The unexpected is, is the thing that I find most pleasurable. That's Kelly Link. She's the author of many books, including the short story collection Pretty Monsters, which is one of the Big Read's newest titles. And this is Artworks, the weekly podcast produced at the National Endowment for the Arts. I'm Josephine Reed. Kelly Link loves to be scared, and she loves to read. So writing ghost stories and fantasy was a smart move on her part. Luckily for us, she's also one terrific writer. She positions the ordinary into fantastical worlds and creates characters that are deeply realized with rich emotional lives. So we can understand their reactions when they spot a werewolf or bump into a ghost. Equally adept at writing for both young adults and adults, Kelly Link is mistress of the unlikely, lending humor effortlessly into stories that are typically rigid in their seriousness. Her collection, Pretty Monsters, is a case in point. All but one of the ten magical stories in Pretty Monsters were written for young adult readers. The heroes of these stories are mostly teenagers, grappling with familiar adolescent angst. But add to that a brew of unexpected monsters, ghosts, pirate magicians, and undead babysitters. And the result is unlikely and yet perfectly believable what Kelly Link calls shape-shifting stories. Kelly Link has received many awards, including three Hugo Awards, a Nebula Award, and an NEA Fellowship in Creative Writing. Recently, she was named a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize for her collection, Get in Trouble. And now Pretty Monsters is one of the Big Read's newest titles. Kelly Link is a meticulous craftsman, no question there but her imagination is still inflamed by that sense of wonder that fantasy fiction and ghost stories have given her since childhood. Both of my parents were, were big readers. Not only did they read, they, they read to me. In fact, when I was little, before I could, before I had learned how to read, my mother read uh, C.S. Lewis to me all the way through the whole, the whole Narnia series. And I still remember my father reading me uh, Tolkien's books. So my first love was fantasy and science fiction and, and ghost stories. How did you get started as a writer? I am not entirely sure. I think the first story I ever finished was in college in a workshop. I took a workshop because, because I loved books so much. I wanted to see if... I could write something that approximated a short story. And so I wrote something for that workshop. And not only did I write a short story, but I, I discovered that I really liked being in a workshop. I liked listening to people talk about the stories that they were reading. I liked hearing people talk about the kinds of problems they had when they wrote stories. So then after that, I, I just kept on taking workshops and writing stories. And my life right now is not particularly different from that. I still meet up with a group of friends who are all writers, and we all work together. And when we finish something or when we're in the middle of a, of a project, we'll share it with each other and talk about writing. How do you begin a story? Do you have a skeleton of the plot? Do you start with the characters? Often what I do is I will think I want, I want to write a scary story or I want to write a love story or I, I think it'd be fun to, to, to write an epistolary story. And usually there's, there's a couple of settings that seem to me that they would be productive to explore, that there's a lot of story attached to those locations. Or I will think, well, here's a kind of person that I haven't gotten to write about before. And, and I, I think I'd like to put them into a ghost story just to see how they would respond. Do you begin a writing day by starting fresh or by revising? Well, the, the first part is often the hardest part, at least for short stories. I find it very hard to pick up any kind of steam until it seems to me that I've got some stuff on the page that is the way that it needs to be. So mm. characters' names, 
even even something as sort of outside of narrative as do the, do the does the rhythm of the sentence feel right for this story or for this character? Is that description is does that tell me something about the way that the point of view character sees the world? And once I have a couple of pages of that, then the story sort of kicks into high gear, and I can uh, keep on going. But every day when I sit down, I do go back to the beginning and revise until I get to the place where I left off, kind of like putting your feet into a pond and getting used to the, the temperature. And when I am stuck during the day while I'm working, I will go back to the beginning and keep on revising until I get to the point where I was stuck and see if anything has been jarred loose. Hmm. You write young adult fiction. I yes. Mean, in the sense that your main characters typically are young adults. Yep. What was the draw to young adult fiction? You know, I've never stopped loving young adult books in terms of what I like to read. I like to read everything, but I am particularly excited by really good young adult stories. For a couple of years, I worked in a kid's bookstore. I went through my MFA program while I was working in a children's bookstore, and that was sort of a chance to revisit books that I hadn't read in a long time as, as well as to read books that I sort of missed out on when I was in college. And I do write adult fiction as well, and it is usually pretty clear to me when I sit down and begin a story what kind of story it's going to be. And what does writing for young adults, as you did for Pretty Monsters, for example, what does that allow you to do that you might not be able to do? Well, I think because I'm drawn to fantasy to begin with, that there is a very clear connection between stories, fantasy stories, many fantasy stories, and young adult, that they're often stories about people discovering a kind of power that they have, coming into a new sphere where their responsibilities are different, finding a, a community of people that they didn't know existed before. And that is true of both fantasy novels and short stories and also of, of young adult. You know, having said that, some of the stories that are in Pretty Monsters are stories that were first published by adult markets. Uh, stories like The Specialist Hat and Magic for Beginners were originally published in adult markets. But when we put this collection together, there's a long tradition of ghost stories belonging sort of equally to to children's books as well as to as well as to adults. Yeah, and we see that with Philip Pullman's editing of Grimm's fairy tales, for example. Yes, absolutely. There would seem to me, especially in your work, a really particular challenge to the fantastical fiction that you create. First, it's fantastical. But yet, the characters themselves seem very real with deep emotional lives. And the stories are often filled with vivid, everyday details. How do you maintain that balance? Well, I, I do think of short stories especially as, you know, these very small containers in which the characters and, and the readers hopefully get to experience very large emotions. And in order to read a story and really connect to it in terms of emotion or, or feeling, the characters have to feel real. You know, we, we care about real people. We care about things that when we encounter them in a narrative, we think, oh, I, I understand how they're feeling. And there's a long tradition of the fantastic of fairy tales where the characters are closer to archetypes, where, you know, we don't really have a lot of sense of their interiority. And those stories work because they're 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 more a kind of a, a pattern of a you know a, a journey or something and they're pleasurable for that reason but what i like about contemporary fantasy is you get to imbue the the characters in the story with feelings that that everybody has had at one point in their life and the fantastic elements or the scary elements in a story that sort of provides the the fun that's sort of the the bonus the the stuff that is you know, not necessarily true of our experience in the world in terms of, you know, we've, we've been to those places. But again, I think the feeling that it evokes in the reader is we think, well, you know, I have been in situations where I realized that something very scary was going on or where I realized I was 
completely out of place or I realized that there was something magical about the experience that I, I was having. And I think, again, that's, that's true of young adult fiction, that, that there is a real sense of almost limitless possibility at certain points when you're an adolescent as you begin to have more responsibilities but also more freedom. Also for me, because I also love young adult fiction, the intensity of feeling Absolutely. Is really kind of extraordinary because, you know, when you're in love, when you're a kid, you're never going to be in love again because this is it and it's love. And, you know, it's, it's amazing. That's <laughs> true. And, and, and the stories that I write that are for adults, I think oftentimes it's here we go again. You know, here's here's this pattern that this person, you know, falls into repeatedly. Mm -hmm. Here's here's a situation with maybe a change or. Or you know, if you're if you're if you're a lucky character in a grown-up story, you think, "Oh, I didn't think I would get to feel this way again, but I do." Right. I always felt like growing up, I discovered the tragedy of love. Isn't that? Oh my God, I'll never love again. It <laughs> is actually that you will. <laughs> <laughs> That's the good part and the bad part too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, the kids in the story, Magic for Beginners, are these kids who are obsessed with this reality show that seems to be off schedule and pops up when it pops up and well it's bleeding into the lives of the characters in the story itself where did this come from you know i had been living in new york and had i got together with a group of friends and we would watch buffy the vampire slayer all together and then we would talk about it so part of the experience of watching the television show was the community that I watched it with. And in some ways, you know, Magic for Beginners is a story about what it is like to be part of a, a fandom, part of a group of people who love something so intensely that they organize their, their life around it, which is, I think, a, a, an experience which is most common when you are young and have more time. Well, in Magic for Beginners, there is this community of kids who come together as friends and fans of the library, the television show. But it's also kind of a dissolution of it because Jeremy, the main character, and his mother are leaving town for an indefinite period of time to look for an inheritance. And, and I, I, honest to God, don't know what the, the enormous appeal for me was about Jeremy inheriting part of the inheritance is a phone booth, <laughs> which he calls regularly, and then his calls begin to get answered. And I was entranced by that. Well, one of the seeds for the story was also the writer Karen Joy Fowler, who I also used to go to California and sit and work with her. Um, she said, I have a really great idea for a novel for you. She said, I read a newspaper article about somebody who inherited a telephone box, oh. and I think you should maybe write a novel about that. And, you know, that seemed great to me, a great starting place. But I also had this, this idea that I also wanted to write about somebody who had inherited a casino, sort of an unusual casino. And I thought, well, somebody who owns a casino probably would also own a telephone box. Why not? Yep. Magic for Beginners is also a great example of meta narrative, which is a technique you often use in your stories. What's the attraction there? Mm, I think the thing about short stories is you only have a certain amount of space to make a world or a set of people three dimensional. And this may seem counterintuitive, but I think that there are things that you can do structurally or there are things that you can do with, with point of view to make it a little bit more challenging for the reader. And maybe they interrupt the story in certain ways. But my general feeling is that if a reader has to do a little bit of work, then they are more likely to be invested in the story that they're reading because they're, they're sort of creating it with the writer and one of the things that you can do with point of view is you can have somebody who's sort of narrating the story, but who isn't part of it. You know, the narrator in Magic for Beginners isn't me. You know, it really, she isn't a character in the story. But, you know, even the fact that it may, for some readers, make the story feel a little bit more artificial, remind them that they're reading a story. But I think my hope is that it also raises an interesting question and sort of invites the reader into the story as well. Well, yes, that's exactly what my note says, because it's not arch or off-putting. It's rather confiding and inviting. 
Confiding is one of my favorite words. When I think about my favorite books, their books are stories where I feel that someone has taken me aside to tell me something because they thought I would be charmed by it or because they thought it might be useful to me or they you know, thought I would enjoy it in some way. One of my favorite books is Dodie Smith's novel, I Capture the Castle, which has one of the best opening sentences ever. The sentence is, I write this sitting in the kitchen sink. And the narrator is a confiding narrator. She is somebody that you want to hang out with. And I find that it's easier to write the story if either the point of view character in it or something about the structure has a similar quality of invitation. You also manage to mix humor into situations that are fraught. And I'm thinking of The Surfer, which is one of the two stories in Pretty Monster that has a first-person narrator. Mm. And it's, you know, it's a complicated story, as most of yours are. It has aliens and a pandemic. (laughs) And the main character, Adorno, his father kidnaps him and they end up quarantined in Costa Rica. And you have this line that literally made me laugh out loud because... Bats are invading the hangar where they're all living in Costa Rica. And his father, who's a doctor, says, don't worry about it. Even though the floor is totally covered in bat guano, it isn't a health risk. (laughs) And then you write, but as a matter of fact, one of the joggers slipped on it the next day and sprained an ankle. And I literally just laughed out loud. It was so funny and unexpected. Well, thank you. I think the the two things that make me happiest if I can achieve them in a story is to make somebody laugh or to make them feel kind of a sense of eeriness or, or maybe a chill. And in some ways, I think the, the, the two sensations, they run parallel with each other. In fact, sometimes I think they're more or less the, the same thing. They're the, you know, the slipping on a banana peel and somebody jumping out to scare you have a similar, I guess, disruptive quality. Yeah, they're unexpected. Of, yes. Yes, and I think the unexpected is is the thing that I find most pleasurable. Well, The Fairy Handbag is the other story with the first-person narrator, and it actually is one of my two favorite in, in this collection. I love that story. Thank you. Can you give us a quick take of it? Sure. I guess I would say that it is a short story told by a girl named Genevieve who is the inheritor of her grandmother's handbag which has gone missing and so she's telling the story of the handbag and how it went missing and the handbag itself is a magical item it contains an entire eastern european village and i absolutely believe that it did <laughs> <It's amazing. laughs> Uh, I was talking with somebody recently about this particular story, and I realized that I think part of the reason why I wrote it was because I had grandmothers with very, very big handbags and a younger sister who, more than anything in the world, wanted to own as many big handbags as possible. One, I think, because she felt that then she would be a grown-up, but two, because she was very organized, and I think she loved the idea of all of the compartments. I get that. And in fact, if you look in any bag, it certainly does tell a story. Absolutely. The story that haunts me is the title one, Pretty Monsters, which is two or more stories that twist on themselves and become intertwined. What's the background on that? That's the last story that I wrote for this collection. There are three stories that fit together at the end, I hope. And I had a story about a girl named Clementine Cleary, and I took it to a workshop and got a lot of feedback on it. One of the things I learned in the workshop was that the story worked, but that it didn't do some of the things that these readers, who are very good readers, felt that I usually did in stories. They they felt that it needed to expand in some way, and so I set it aside. And then I thought, well, what if what if I told a sort of a secondary story about about two sisters uh, that would slot in? It would maybe never touch in a totally concrete way, but it would be it would be connected. And then I did that. And then once I had the two stories, I rewrote the first one. I began to tease stuff apart and put stuff together. And then 
Um, when I got to the end, I thought, oh, look, there's there's space here for one very, very short last story that would be fun to tell. And part of this was, I think, because I'm very fond of young adult fiction in which the main characters are adolescent girls. I'm also very fond of stories about monsters. I love movies like Ginger Snaps in which adolescent girls also turn out to be monsters. And so I wanted to sort of explore the intersection of being monstrous and being being adolescent, being wild. Well, as you say at the end of that story, stories shift their shape. And boy, that one was a multiple shape shifter. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> I want to talk about endings because I think they are difficult. And I think some of your stories end abruptly. Monster, for example, and in Pretty Monsters, you write, the end of the story will have to wait. And I think you do that with some of your stories. So yes. it's a choice. Why? Yes, it is, a, it is a choice. I think when I first started writing stories, that the thing that always felt the most artificial to me was any sort of sense that things should tie up neatly, that the stories that I liked best were stories where you gave enough uh, momentum to the events of the story, to the characters, that you filled things in enough that, that the ends of the stories felt a little bit like jumping off places or like sort of leaving somebody at the top of a roller coaster where you think, well, I've set up enough stuff that you know, you can hopefully imagine some things that might happen next. I hope you know the characters well enough to go along with them, to keep on going even after the story stops. And I also think, you know, this is, this is after writing for a long time, teaching workshops for a very long time, talking about stories in general, that stories where the endings are, are too tidy are stories which in the long run are easier for readers to think, well, I got what I was going to get out of that story, and now I can stop thinking about it. And my hope is that by maybe raising questions more than I answer, that even if there's something a little unsatisfying to the reader, it means that they get to keep on thinking about it oh. even after they've finished. Boy, I really can't get that story out of my mind. Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry, but I'm also very glad. <laughs> Well, the collection itself was illustrated by Sean Tan, and he created a drawing for each story. Can you tell me about that process and how you collaborated together? Yes. When I sold this collection to an editor at, at Viking Penguin, one of the things that I really hoped was that there would be an illustrated component to it. And I am an enormous fan of Sean Tan's work, of his writing, his art, his graphic novel, The Arrival, is, is one of my very favorite books. And so when my editor asked if I had any ideas for an artist, I said, well, you know, I only know him a little bit, but the dream illustrator for me would be Sean Tan. And she got in touch with him and he agreed. And that was absolutely the best part of writing these these stories it felt like a felt like a gift so I sent the stories to him and he asked a couple of questions but I think mostly what I said was whatever you do I'm gonna like uh, and that was that was definitely the case do you find joy in writing oh <laughs> yes and no uh, I often find it pretty excruciating but I work through that. You know, I, I don't like the, the sort of first part of the day sitting down to write. And I typically don't like my drafts before the sentences start to feel right to me. You know, I, I do know writers who find writing pleasurable, who are, I think, natural storytellers and can work very quickly. And I am happy when I can work quickly and when I'm stuck in sort of a slower part or when I'm trying to come up with a container to put the stuff into it that I want to put into it, it's actually pretty miserable. But, you know, having said that, I wouldn't want to do anything else. Mm -hmm. You've received many awards, including a literature fellowship from the National Endowment for the Arts. What did that fellowship allow you to do? You know, it felt like this reassurance that what I was doing was worth it. It's not 
maybe a good thing to have constant validation that, that you're doing everything exactly the way that you should be doing it. But I think when you're a writer, when your work is mostly self-directed, to be given a grant and be told, we think you should keep on doing this. In fact, we feel that so strongly, we're going to give you some money. You know, that was uh, extraordinary. And the other thing, too, is there was a period of time in which I didn't teach. I could just write. I could sit and think about what I wanted to write. You know, I could write. I could sit and think. All of that is is extraordinarily useful. And Pretty Monsters has been named a new Big Read title. What is What does that mean for you? Boy, you know, <laughs> I don't even really know. It's exciting. I What I didn't realize when I started writing was how happy it makes me one, to get to meet other people who want to write, whatever stage of their career they're, they're at. Two, that I just really love talking to people about stories. And so the idea that there are community events in which everybody has read the same book and then get together and discuss it with each other is really exciting, regardless of whether or not it's my book. The idea that it might be by my book is really thrilling. The idea that, that people would get to ask me questions or tell me about something that it made them want to do is, is really, really exciting. Well, I'm glad you brought that up about questions because to the discussion questions that we have up on the Big Read website, you added the last question, which was if you could ask the author one question about these stories or about writing them, what would it be? I know it's early in the day, but I'm curious if you've gotten any responses. I have not, no. Okay, you have to keep us posted when you do. (laughs) I will, and I'm really looking forward to that. I have to say that I don't think I've ever had anybody ask me a question or sort of express an opinion about something that I've written that was disheartening. I think any question that anybody asks in a genuine or sincere way is sort of a, a gift to the writer, you know, that somebody felt moved enough that they wanted to tell you something or ask you something. And sometimes when people say to me, well, I really loved this story in a collection, or I really loved this particular collection, sometimes I like to say, well, what story didn't you like? What was the story that, that, that you read and you thought, no, that, that just almost for the purposes of helping me figure out how people read things and the kinds of things that somebody might respond to in positive or negative ways. And finally, what's next? Well, I am working on a novel. Whoa. Uh, I Yes. That's a change. It's a huge change. And I will say that the first year of working on it was really tricky. It was very, very uh, hard to figure out what exactly I wanted to do and how to do it. And now I am actually having a great deal of fun. It's nice to have such an expansive project. And I'd love to have you complete this sentence. If you like Kelly Link's stories, you might also like... Oh, that has actually genuinely thrown me. Oh, Um, my God. (laughs) I'm the daughter of a a psychologist. (laughs) And so I think there are certain kinds of questions that I can imagine sort of a sea of possibilities. Let's go with Halloween. You might also like Halloween. That's kind of perfect since it's coming up. (laughs) That's author Kelly Link. Her short story collection, Pretty Monsters, is one of the new Big Read titles. You can check out the rest at neabigread.org. You've been listening to Artworks, produced at the National Endowment for the Arts. To find out how art works in communities across the country, keep checking the Artworks blog or follow us at NEA Arts on Twitter. For the National Endowment for the Arts, I'm Josephine Reed. Thanks for listening.